but in a way my talk kind of is a bit unusual because usually with disorders you start off thinking about adults and then you kind of wonder about how they might affect children but for ADHD it's actually the opposite um, most of what's been known about ADHD has been known about children and it's been accepted in children for a very long time um, and it's really only recently that we've begun to kind of think about it in terms of how it affects adults so in this talk I'll be looking at these broad areas and there will be a little bit of overlap um, into what has already been discussed um, but just in terms of the introduction it, it for years we kind of wondered what happened to children with ADHD as they grew older um, and the answer is that for a long time nobody really knew and nobody was really following it up but more recently people have begun to study it and they've begun to see that the symptoms persist and the ranges of persistence, the estimates for persistence, they vary, but a reasonable conservative estimate would be that about 50% of people will continue to have symptoms, and some estimates would go so far as to say that 15% will have you know, the full uh, range of symptoms, and a further 50% will be very significantly impaired. So you can see that it continues, um, and it doesn't just go away. Um, Aileen has already referenced the uh, diagnosis of ADHD and um, there are similarities between the diagnosis in adults and in children and the criteria that we use are quite similar and they're based on uh, the same diagnostic instruments and the same um, tools but there are some really important um, differences. Um, so when we think of children with ADHD we can think of a very um, mo they have a lot of motor hyperactivity. They might be, um, an alien was commenting in a few examples about how they might be jumping into things, playing with a lot of toys, doing lots of different things. For adults, sometimes it's not as obvious. So the motor activity can actually change a little bit. So it becomes less clear. But what you might end up with is the, a feeling of restlessness, a fidgetiness, an inability to sit down a f uh, for long periods of time, a feeling as if you're driven by a motor. And sometimes what we would see are people who would present and they would say, I'm at work, but I keep on having to get up out of my seat or I just find it really hard to sit down and finish all the forms and I find myself moving around the office a lot. And that, that's how it might present. So it's a little bit more, it's subtle sometimes, that piece in adults. The impulsivity persists, but the impulsivity can often change. So in, in terms of how it presents. So for children, um, you can see a child be, impulsively going over and climbing a wall or uh, doing something like that. Most adults won't do that, but the impulsivity for adults will change in terms of decision making and in terms of the choices that they might make. So it might be something like choosing a job without actually thinking it through or making other choices that don't actually, uh, that haven't been thought through. It's just what grabs the person, what appeals to them at that point in time, and they don't think it through and they just go with that um, decision. For the attention piece and the inattention piece, this is something that persists and again can be quite easily missed and one of the best ways about thinking about it is that the tasks that an adult does or ta the tasks that an adult has to do are quite different to those of a child so you might have somebody um, in a marriage let's say a husband um, and uh, has to is given a chore to do just pulling that out of never really happens but uh, they might be given something to do and they're given a list of things to do and they might let's say it's something to buy in a shop they might um, think they might be given the list they might leave the house leave the list behind then they might go in the car realize the car needs petrol then go and get the petrol then they've by the time it's all done they've forgotten what they had to get in the shop they come back home and as you can imagine a, a heated uh, discussion or <laughs> colorful argument can sometimes ensue um, and it, it, that's not the only time that that could happen. It could be things about bills, about paying bills on time, about putting things away, about tidying, um, keeping the house tidy, keeping um, a room tidy, and or even an office space tidy. Um, and again, it's very similar to Aileen's example of uh, how you might start off with great intentions. You might start off tidying something away, and then you might get a text from somebody, and, oh, that's something else I need to do. And then you'd move on to something else and something else. And before you know it, no task has been completed. And the big problem with that is that sometimes it's misinterpreted. Um, and this isn't just another excuse for any of us or any husbands who mightn't be <laughs> doing the housework but uh, sometimes this is misinterpreted and what happens is that it's thought that this is you know laziness or they just don't want to do this or um, it's willful whereas in fact actually it's oftentimes the people want to do it and they want to be able to perform better but they just can't 
So um, other examples might be people, not just at home, but people in jobs uh, where they move from, um, you know, where they might start a job, they might start a particular job, then the job might change and they might become more form based or filling out paper and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden they'll begin to realise that they can't function at that job the same way as they did before. Um, and they will be in trouble sometimes for not filling out forms, for not meeting deadlines. And it's not that they don't want to do it. It's just that that piece of their brain that is meant to say listen you just have to sit down and do this and filter out everything else that that piece isn't working to the same level as it could be so it's that piece of the brain that's me that's meant to plan that's meant to filter out external uh, distractions and even internal distractions and meant to keep focus that that just isn't working as well as it could be and that's what leads to all the problems for people who are with people or around people who may have adult ADHD, sometimes it might be other signs might be in conversations. Um, you might see that they might drift out of conversation um, and they themselves will report drifting out of conversations. They might come back and say, you know, I was in the conversation um, and I couldn't remember what was being said. Um, and sometimes they might seem even as if they're in a world of their own. So all of those things can, can happen and they can cause, the piece about all of this is that at a certain level, a lot of us can identify or may have experienced some or other of those symptoms from time to time. But for ADHD, they're pervasive, they're very severe, and they're causing a lot of um, impairment and often cause a lot of distress. Um, so we already spoke about the scientific basis. One of the issues that's come up um, regarding adult ADHD is a certain scepticism about it. Um, childhood ADHD has been accepted for years, but when it's come to uh, under generating understanding and acceptance of adult ADHD, that's been actually more difficult. It is a real thing. It is something that's there. It's not a character flaw. It's not laziness. It's actually a real condition. And the brain imaging studies would show that. Um, and what they show is that, the, as Alien was pointing out, that those centers of the brain that are required for planning, required to execute tasks, that they're not um, w functioning to the same level as they might be. Um, and it's also quite a heritable condition. So this further supports the idea of it being a biological and a real entity um, is the fact that when they look at genetic studies, they find that there is quite a substantial genetic component um, to it. Um, and it um, is over there in the middle there, just showing that um, it has, over on the left, showing that you know the genetic piece is quite, it can be significant. Um, so this also is important for people who might have children um, with ADHD. Um, just sometimes um, in parents it's worthwhile wondering or worthwhile asking themselves if there might be some traits of that they might also have. It's not always the case, but it's often um, worth thinking about. So in terms of suggested causes, um, I've mentioned the genetic factors um, and there's a very strong contribution uh, from genetic factors and there's also um, environmental factors. Now the issues about the environmental factors are that some of these are debated, um, some of these aren't so clear. There's thoughts that exposure to smoking during pregnancy um, may um, increase a risk of ADHD. With all of these um, studies and, and environmental factors, it's really important to kind of uh, be a little bit circumspect about them all um, because we are at the early stages of this uh, condition and our understanding of it and we really um, can't say for certain or with any great uh, certainty about these factors. So for example, if you take cigarette smoking, um, it is very possible, and this is just another interpretation of that study, that people who have ADHD can sometimes have increased risk, uh, can have increased prevalences of smoking anyway. And sometimes actually nicotine was used and is used sometimes as a final step or a, one of the steps in treatment sometimes of ADHD. So you can see how people who smoke w might have increased incidence of ADHD and how that might be something that's confounding this picture. So it's just important to kind of bear in mind that the evidence around diet, um, there's been a lot of talk about diet. Um, the evidence actually isn't that strong, but still it's really important to remember that diet does can affect behaviour. And obviously a good healthy diet um, is important. Um, and there are other factors such as neurotoxins and issues about lead that have also been discussed um, in terms of their potential contribution. So when it comes to adults, um, the diagnosis um, has to be a, a rigorous and fairly complex diagnosis. 
and we depend on we rely on internationally validated and recognized tools for diagnosis and these are um, semi-structured interviews um, incorporated into a comprehensive psychiatric assessment so what does that mean well really what it means is you're looking for clear symptoms um, that are consistent with ADHD and as I said it's not just having one or two it's about having a range of symptoms that are pervasive, that are in a, a lot of different settings and that are causing um, functional impairment. It's also about assessing for other medical conditions and other psychiatric conditions. So the psychiatric conditions may be causing the symptoms. So there are other psychiatric uh, conditions that can uh, lead to symptoms similar to ADHD, but also uh, psychiatric conditions can be very much comorbid with ADHD. Um, so in terms of the comorbid diagnosis, if you can imagine uh, with ADHD and if somebody isn't sure what's been going on for them and they might be underachieving at home or not reaching their full potential at home or at work, um, you can imagine and you can understand the frustration that that can lead in, uh, to in people. They might again think that this is something about them, this is something about their character, this is um, you know, it's something that in, that's just they're not able to achieve what they want. And this leads to frustration. It can lead to depression. It can be associated with anxiety um, and it also can lead to disorders of emotional regulation. So what I mean by that is sometimes it can become very frustrating um, if you've got if for, on the subjective level, a lot of different thoughts going around at any one time, really hard to filter what's going on, really hard to plan. Um, and therefore you can have um, kind of outbursts of emotion, just where it all gets too much and there can be um, an outburst. Um, so we've already touched on a lot of these treatments for the children and in adults we're looking at similar types of approaches. So it's got to do with biological treatments, psychological treatments and social treatments. So the occupational therapy treatments have already been extremely comprehensively covered. Um, and they're very similar in um, adults as they would be. There are similar approaches in adults as there would be in children. In terms of one area that comes up quite a bit would be in terms of uh, work. So um, what you may find with people with uh, ADHD is that uh, work and third level education is that they've been functioning OK, but now they reach a level where something is happening at work. The structure has changed. So it's really important to explore with people um, what is what changes might be made. Um, do they need a more active role? Do they need a role that's less paper based, less form filling based, something that might suit them a little better, something with frequent uh, breaks and also similarly for third level. Um, it's important for people to kind of look at what supports they might need um, to help them get through that better. Psychological treatments, um, we've had a look at what can happen psychologically uh, for people with, uh, for adults with ADHD. There can be, if it's not detected, if it's not picked up, if it's not treated and managed properly, there can be problems. And the problems can be in education, we've seen, there can be problems at work, um, and also problems um, in relationships. And those problems can add up, and those problems can lead to difficulties further down the line. They can e increase the risks of risk-taking behaviour, they can increase the risks of substance misuse. There there are a lot of, I think other people may have mentioned just in children you've got the dangerous behaviours, in adults you can have s dangerous behaviours or impulsive or risky behaviours in areas like driving and that sort of thing as well. So it's really important that this is something that's picked up and that's understood quickly. So the psychological treatments try to focus on psychoeducation which is explaining what's been going on for people, telling them what, what has been happening to them. And the amount of times that people feel a sense of relief um, just from understanding that this is not something inherently wrong with them, that this is something that's real, that's treatable and that's manageable, it, it's really quite striking how even that piece can be really important. And then when that information is shared with re in the relationship or at work, that's also really important. So that can be a big burden for, uh, removed from people. In terms of CBT or cognitive behavioural therapy, it's about cognitive reframing, it's about looking at the things that can be done, it's about changing from a sense of pessimism, that I can't do this, that I won't be able to do this, into a sense of optimism and a feeling that I can do some things. And it's also really important with psychological treatments to be treating um, comorbid conditions. Um, then Aileen already alluded to the medications, and these are going to be very similar in um, adults um, as in um, children. Um, the broad groups are stimulants and non-stimulants and as Alien was saying the idea behind the stimulants is that they're stimulating that part of the 
brain that forms plans and um, it removes distractions. Um, and then um, we already touched on the, the non-stimulants and the mechanism of action. Um, Again, dopamine and noradrenaline are extremely important. There is a difference in terms of time to response. And um, there's probably a few other medications that we might use in adults that mightn't be used so much in children. For example, bupropion is an antidepressant that's sometimes used to help with focus um, in adults that may not be used um, as much as um, in children. And Aileen already alluded to um, the side effects and they're um, very similar as well um, between both um, groups. It's really important if people are considering starting a medication that they're familiar um, with um, the different effects of, of both. Um, the next slide here, it, it, the next slide here, has really got to do with uh, service provision, and the reason for including this is because I think it's something that, um, when people look at this, they actually beca can become quite frustrated or can become, uh, you know, where do I go? How do I get treated? What do I do? The truth of the matter is, is that there, this is a new area, and it's not just new in Ireland; it's new internationally. Um, so the area of adult ADHD is something that is uh, being recognised, is being developed across the board um, and across countries. And the challenges that face us here are somewhat similar in many ways to challenges that might face other people in other countries. But it is new. Um, there's a real need for um, increased education, increased recognition of it, um, and there's also a need for a kind of a national type approach to it and a greater understanding um, of how to treat it um, and even education and awareness events that have been organised, uh, such as this one, can be really helpful in terms of um, promoting that. So, in terms of summary, um, these are the main points, I suppose. It is a treatable condition, it is a real condition, um, and as we've seen, the treatments um, include the psychological, occupational therapy and medication treatments. We've seen the similarities between adult um, ADHD and child ADHD, and we've also um, hopefully seen some of the differences um, between the two groups. So um, thank you very much.